Well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk about disease management in oilseed rape. So this is the DEFRA-funded survey, and I'm going to focus on light leaf spot and FOMA, the two most damaging diseases in oilseed rape. One way to control the diseases is obviously uh, through fungicides, and there are forecasting schemes such as this web-based forecasting scheme that you can find on the Rothamsted website to guide use of fungicides. This scheme uh, forecasts the date when uh, there will be 10% leaf spotting in different regions of the country. So growers can uh, click on the website, look at their particular area, and see a uh, predicted date when uh, the, that elseed rape crops will have 10% leaf spotting, and then obviously go out and inspect their crops. However, I'm not going to say anything more about fungicides in this talk. I'm going to focus primarily on disease resistance. So starting with light leaf spot... As you could see from the data presented, the importance of light leaf spot has been increasing year on year over the last few years in the UK. Uh, and those data were just for England. Obviously, it's a major disease problem on oilseed rape in Scotland too. And it attacks leaves, stems, and pods. Epidemics start in the autumn with airborne ascospores. And initially, it's difficult to see the symptoms, though I have seen symptoms of light leaf spot in, in crops this autumn already. You get production of secondary spores uh, the conidia, which are then splash dispersed, and you get further uh, cycles of disease for this polycyclic disease. Firstly on leaves, and then onto stems and pods. And it's the disease uh, on leaves in winter and on pods that causes the yield loss. So what about resistance against this Sometimes when cultivars are introduced initially, they have uh, good resistance against light leaf spot. These data were for Apex, and you can see when it was first introduced, there wasn't too much light leaf spot. But with time, the pathogen population changed, and the apex became more and more susceptible to the light leaf spot pathogen, Paranapoziza brassicae. This is good circumstantial evidence that there's some sort of gene-for-gene -gene relationship with changes in the pathogen population for virulence uh, leading to a cultivar becoming more and more susceptible so there's a need to understand more about the genetics of resistance. One gene for resistance against light leaf spot, which was identified in Emily Boyes's project, PhD project, is in this cultivar, Imola. And that resistance leads to uh, a limitation of the asexual sporulation that you see in the susceptible. Instead, you get this black flecking in Imola, and it's particularly noticeable along the leaf veins. There's one interesting thing about this resistance. 
and that's that the, the black flecking, which is associated with cell death, occurs some eight days after inflection. And that's quite different from the sort of resistance that you might get uh, leading to a hypersensitive reaction against a powdery mildew or yellow rust. Here's some scanning electron micrographs, and you can see lots of hyphae in the susceptible. By comparison, very few hyphae in the resistant. You can see production of asexual spores in the susceptible, and instead, in the resistant, at about the time when the pathogen is trying to produce its asexual spores, you get collapse of cells, and uh, there is no production of asexual spores. However, another interesting feature of this resistance is that when the host tissue senesces, it's obvious that the resistance has not killed the pathogen because it can go on and produce sexual spores. These are apothecia that you get these airborne ascospores ejected from and you get sexual sporulation of the pathogen on both the susceptible and the resistant. So just some conclusions about light leaf spot. It's a major focus for disease control in the UK now because its severity has increased. All seed rape cultivars do differ in resistance against the pathogen, but it's not clearly understood at this point in time uh, what resistance genes there are in different cultivars. There's a need to identify races of Paranopoziza brassicae in the same way that races of other pathogens have been identified. And we do have um, a PhD student who's just started looking at uh, pathogen races, but there is a need to identify sources of resistance. And HDCA has uh, provided us part funding towards a studentship to work on this. We are looking for uh, other collaborators to come into the project, so if anyone's interested, uh, come and see me afterwards. And I'm now going to move on to uh, FOMA stem canker. Light leaf spot is very much a UK problem. The other country in the world where you find severe light leaf spot is, is New Zealand, but most of the other oilseed rape growing countries of the world don't have it. That's not the case with stem canker caused by Leptospheria species. Globally, it probably causes losses of more than a thousand million pounds per season, with particularly severe epidemics in Australia and sometimes in parts of continental Europe. This is associated with two related pathogens. There is Leptospheria maculans, which traditionally we regard as associated with the damaging stem-based cankers. And traditionally, we associate Leptospheria biglobosa with upper stem lesions, which normally in the UK are less damaging. And these two coexisting pathogens exist together on oilseed rape crops in the UK. They're able to coexist because their ascospores are released at slightly different times. There are some differences in the ways in which they infect the crop. Both of them grow from the leaf spots down the leaf stalks to reach the stem, and there is some separation in space between them because, as I said, usually 
you find more Leptospheria maculans at the stem base and more Leptospheria biglobosa further up the stem. Now that's not always the case, as we shall see. This data from Jenna Stonard's, Jenna Watts's PhD, shows that uh, in this season, the Leptospheria maculan spores were being released before the Leptospheria biglobosa spores. And that is usually what happens but it is influenced by weather factors. Right. Can we move on to the next one? Seems to... Right. We have uh, a BBSRC link project to which HGCA is contributing on understanding resistance to decrease the risk of severe stem canker on oilseed rape. And as you can see, there are other funders in there. There are some charities involved in funding, and there are many uh, oilseed rape breeders also involved in this project. So it, it's good to get round the table a group of industry uh, members to discuss this, this problem on oilseed rape. And we usually have some quite lively consortium meetings. Some data from this project showing that uh, at different sites in the UK, this is Hertfordshire and Lincolnshire, the timing of Ascospore release, that's uh, in this instance, the uh, ascospores of both of these related pathogens, the, the timing uh, differs between parts of the UK and also obviously differs between seasons. So if we look at this season, 2011-2012, we see that the ascospores are released much later than in the previous season or in the following season. And this is an interesting season to, to look at. We find that in this season, we, in the 2011-2012 season, we got leaf spot lesions on the upper leaves, and this then led to upper stem lesions. And these upper stem lesions were quite severe, and you got stem break uh, from these upper stem lesions. And in this season, when we looked at the pathogen composition, we find that it was primarily Leptospheria biglobosa in the upper stem lesions. They were much more damaging than normal, and also, we found a lot of Leptospheria biglobosa in the stem bases. So, in that season, Leptospheria biglobosa was probably the major component of the FOMA stem canker epidemic, whereas normally we would expect that to be Leptospheria maculans. So whilst we've got these two coexisting species in the UK, in some seasons, damaging epidemics can be associated with Leptospheria biglobosa. Now this is interesting because Leptospheria biglobosa is much less sensitive to some fungicides than Leptospheria maculans. So there is an interaction between uh, fungicides and the two coexisting species. There is also an interaction between cultivar resistance and the two species. Some cultivars that are susceptible to uh, Leptospheria biglobosa are more resistant to maculans and vice versa. So you can't necessarily control both species with the same fungicide or with the same cultivar resistance. So there is 
a need to examine strategies for managing Leptospheria bigdobosa as well as Leptospheria maculans. Moving on to Leptospheria maculans, there are two types of resistance against Leptospheria maculans. Firstly, there's R gene mediated resistance that operates when the pathogen is trying to infect leaves initially. It enters, the spores germinate on the leaves, the pathogen enters through the stomata, and uh, shortly after that, it's recognized by a resistant host. And as with Paranopoziza brassicae, the resistance mechanism doesn't actually kill the pathogen, but it does stop it growing. It stops it getting to the stem, and therefore you don't get cankers if you've got effective R gene resistance. There's also quantitative resistance, which is not complete resistance, but it does slow down the growth of the pathogen as it's going down the leaf stalk towards the stem, and it slows the growth in the stem tissues. This slide from Australia shows what this pathogen, Leptospheria maculans, can do when resistance breaks down. Here, on the right-hand side, we've got an example of a crop. Now, this crop had had a resistance gene bred into it over a period of uh, some 15 years. The resistance gene had been found in a wild brassica uh, in, in Europe, but then it was bred into this Australian cultivar. They did not put much quantitative resistance in the background. They introduced this resistance gene. It provided excellent resistance, no stem canker in the first year, but by two years later, this is what's happening, and growers were suffering 90% yield loss from this disease. By comparison, a uh, cultivar that had some quantitative resistance in it, this, they put a resistance gene in a, in a susceptible background. A cultivar that had some quantitative resistance uh, was yielding considerably better. So this pathogen, uh, if it is faced with a susceptible cultivar, if it's able to overcome the resistance, can cause considerable yield losses in oilseed rape. The traditional way to assess races of this pathogen is through uh, obtaining isolates and then testing them on cotyledons. Um, you have to use what's called a differential set of host material. Each one has a different resistance gene. And then if the isolate has the matching AVR gene uh, and is avirulent, you'll get a resistance response on the cotyledon. By comparison, if you have a virulent isolate, you'll get a lesion formed on the cotyledon. This is quite a time-consuming way to assess pathogen populations. It probably takes about three months to do a test. In our project, we have some 15 sites uh, operated by the partners, by the breeders, and uh, most of them in the UK, but some of the breeders are also operating in continental Europe, so we've got a few sites outside the UK. At all the sites, we are sampling leaves of this susceptible cultivar, Draca, so that we can obtain isolates which we then screen to see what uh, avirulence 
and virulence is present against different R genes in those isolates. We're also operating spore samplers at four of the sites, and I'll explain what we're doing. We've already seen some results from that. This uh, data is for uh, the isolates that we have obtained using the DRACAR. And you can see these are the pathogen AVR genes that match the host R genes. And for these three, the population is 100% avirulent. So that means that those three R genes are effective at controlling the disease. By comparison for these three, AVRLM9, 3, and 2, there are no avirulent isolates. The population is 100% virulent. So these genes in Europe are not effective for controlling this pathogen. Uh, I think in Canada, some of these genes, uh, these matching R genes, are being used effectively. So the differences between the population of Leptospheria maculans in Europe and in Canada. So this shows some of the sites that are being operated by the different members of the consortium. And... As I've been saying, those three R genes, RLM5, 6, and 7, are potentially effective. Um, actually, I think RLM5 and 6 are not much used in commercial cultivars in Europe. RLM7 is a different story, as we shall see in a minute. Uh, RLM2, 3, and 9 are ineffective and they would be absolutely useless against this pathogen uh, if they were bred into cultivars. There are some R genes where the population differs between different sites. So for RLM1, and RLM4, we find that there are differences in the proportions of avirulent and virulent isolates between different sites. And where you have differences in populations between different sites, that then means that there is the possibility of deploying different R genes in different sites in order to control the disease. I said that we have been operating these Burkhard spore samplers and you saw some data about numbers of ASCA spores. Where virulence against the R gene results from deletion of the matching AVR gene in the pathogen then it is possible to use uh, quantitative PCR to assess the proportions of avirulent isolates in the population at any given place. And this is much, much quicker than a three-month uh, cotyledon test. And you can sample also a much larger population of spores. RLM7 is interesting. Uh, it has been widely deployed in oilseed rape cultivars in France and Germany. And the breeders tell me that probably about 30 or 40% of the UK acreage is sown to RLM7 cultivars. During the course of our project, we started to see leaf spots on RLM7 cultivars. So the question is, are these leaf spots 
associated with Leptospheria biglobosa, or are they associated with virulent isolates, isolates that are virulent against this RLM7? We have been seeing increasingly severe leaf spotting on RLM7 cultivars. Those last leaves on the last slide were from 2010. This is 2011, uh, uh, 2012, 2013. So we're getting more and more leaf spots on these RLM7 cultivars. And we're starting to get cankers on these RLM7 cultivars. Now the answer to my question, uh, the data we've got so far, some of the leaf spots, some of the cankers are associated with Leptospheria biglobosa, but about 3% of the Leptospheria maculans population is starting to be virulent against uh, the RLM7 resistance gene that is being widely deployed in UK oilseed rape. In some other countries, the industry has got together and developed management schemes for advising farmers what cultivars to grow in, in specific regions. This is certainly the case in Australia where they experience such catastrophic epidemics. The uh, GRDC has uh, a scheme which is used throughout Australia and growers are advised to select cultivars that have better resistance and populations of the pathogen are being monitored to see what virulence is present. This is also the case in uh, Canada, France, and Germany. So we have new opportunities to determine what Leptospheria maculans races are present by using air sampling and PCR, but work is needed to monitor regional distribution of races if we are to develop a strategy for regional deployment of different sources of resistance. So some take-home messages. Diseases are still causing large losses in UK oilseed rape crops despite our best efforts to control them. The disease spectrum is changing. At one stage, canker was most important. Now we're seeing uh, light leaf spot as the most important disease. Maybe in another five years' time, it'll be canker or something else. And pathogen populations are changing. As we deploy different cultivars with different resistance genes, we find that the populations change. There is a need for good resistance against these pathogens. But now, with new genetic and genomic information coming on stream, there is the possibility to exploit that to improve resistance. There's a need for new strategies to manage these diseases. And particularly, I would have said there's a need to save RLM7 resistance in uh, UK oilseed rape cultivars. I was uh, speaking to a government official in China about uh, disease management, and he said, normally we don't do anything about epidemics till they hit us. Well, actually, the Chinese government did something about it and uh, tried to stop Leptospheria maculans coming into China. I was speaking to uh, a group in Canada a couple of years ago 
about managing resistance against Leptospheria maculans. They've taken some action. So uh, my challenge to you as an industry is, are you prepared to work together to save RLM7 resistance against Leptospheria maculans and protect UK Aussie grape crops? And I'd like to finish by thanking those who've contributed to this work and those who funded it. And finally, to mention that at the University of Hertfordshire, we are starting a new degree course in sustainable agriculture and food security. And we're looking for placements for the students, um, both summer placements and one-year placements. So if anyone's interested, come and see me afterwards. Thank you very much.